I would say this, the fact that the attack took place didn't surprise me. You grow up without hope and you grow up on a diet of hating Israel because, you know, you see Israel as the oppressor and Israel, you feel, is controlling every aspect of your life. So how long can that be bottled up? So the speed and the effectiveness surprised me, but the fact that the Palestinians rose up to uh, attack didn't surprise me. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Yala, your thrice weekly podcast where we talk about the hottest news with some very interesting people. Uh, we're always with a touch of what, Terence? Good old humor. Good old humor, man. Yeah. And today is uh, another special episode where yes. we have someone in our studio uh, we've been wanting to get on for a while. Yeah, long time. Uh, long yeah. time. And it is none other than Minister of Home Affairs and Minister of Law, Minister Shamugam. Yes. Welcome to Yalabat. Thank you. This yeah. is your Yalabat debut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, yes. Minister. Yeah, welcome. And um, it, it's, it's great to have you because there are so many things we want to talk to you about. Uh, and, and it feels like nowadays, every day, there's something new. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and and tell me about it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's your past thirty plus years, lah. Yes, yeah, yeah. right. Well, it's getting faster and faster. It's getting quicker faster, and f- quicker, mm. quicker and quicker. Yeah. So, so I mean, like we we know that you were traveling recently. Uh, yes, uh, and you were in Germany and France. France and Germany in that order. Ah, France mm. and Germany in that yes. order, and and you were you have been back, and I assume there's also always traveling around the corner. Well, I. Try not to travel too much overseas. Mm. I keep my travel to the minimum. As Home Affairs Minister, as Law Minister, I don't have to travel. It's not like being the Foreign Minister mm-hmm. or the Minister for Trade and Industry where you know you have to interact a lot. Mm. But nevertheless, there are important meetings uh, for interior ministers, for law ministers, mm. and uh, either I or one of my colleagues will go. I see, I see, yeah. I see, I see, and and I mean, it's interesting. We we got you today uh, because there is one particular thing we want to talk to you about, yes, uh, which has been ongoing for a long while. Right, uh, it is the unfortunate um, things that are unfolding in the Middle East, mm. uh, specifically with Israel and Hamas, and just so happens that we are recording today. There's been new developments about the the truce. Yes, yeah. Mm. So so I mean, just to dive straight in. Um, it, like we we've been do, we've done a few podcasts where we've been trying to unpack what has been happening. Right. Uh, at this point in time, uh, you know, early December, what? How would you like like? How, what, what should we be thinking about as Singaporeans? Well, what should they be thinking about? You know, Singaporeans are affected by what they see, mm. and uh, understandably so. Mm. And there's a, there's been a range of reactions. If you look at the reactions, they see the images, they see young children, they see women, they see innocent civilians all being caught up and uh, severely damaged. They are lives being lost. And of course, people are empathetic, they are sympathetic, and uh, some segments are enraged by Mm. what they see, Mm. civilian lives being lost. Uh, It's entirely understandable. What I would say is it's useful for us to have uh, a deeper understanding of why this is happening. Mm. And I think a lot of people around the world, I wouldn't say just Singapore, probably uh, don't realize that there are deeper uh, strategic reasons why uh, some of these things are happening. Mm. These are, there are geopolitical reasons. Mm. And I would mention three in particular, three actors in particular, which I think um, uh, the result uh, or the reason why this is happening now. Mm. One is Hamas. If you look at Hamas, Hamas's covenant is for the destruction of Israel. Mm. They want a Palestinian state from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean yes. Sea. And they want Israel destroyed. They say Oslo Accords are illegal. They say Israel is illegal. And Hamas is in charge in Gaza. And as long as you have Hamas in charge, you're not going to have a two-state solution Mm -hmm. because they don't accept the state of Israel. Second, some significant elements within Israel itself. You have people, the extreme right wing in Israel, which also do not want 
a two state and they say so mm. and some of them are in power and uh, they don't see a way in which israel can coexist with uh, a palestinian state and they think of the whole area as belonging to israel and mm. they said things like that and israel's settlements on the west bank which the united nations has uh, said is illegal and we have uh, said is uh, unacceptable mm. because they are contrary to international law so you have that element in israel which is uh, in a position to influence policy making mm. which doesn't want two states yeah and which takes a very hard position of uh, israeli power or hard view of israeli power and the third is uh, iran hmm. uh, iran has uh, a different agenda you know it wants to be the leader of the muslim world and uh, hamas hezbollah these are proxies and uh, israel the destruction of israel is part of uh, iran's uh, stated ambition hmm. and uh, i don't think iran wants to see a peaceful two state solution either because the very existence of israel is anathema to iran so you have three there are many other factors but you know even these three factors hmm. are a serious uh, block and a hurdle to a peaceful solution and uh, each of these actors if you look at them hamas has publicly said the human shield is an effective strategy the more people who die the more israel gets delegitimized hmm. from israel's perspective hamas is that organization that has to be wiped out but until now they coexisted but now they say it's got to be wiped out from iran's perspective again the more civilians who die uh, the uh, you know the more israel is delegitimized from israel's perspective well there are these terrorists and i have to kill them and i don't care about or while i try and minimize the collateral damage that's not my primary concern mm-hmm. so you you have these uh, variety of uh, Uh, opinions and factors and i think uh, a deeper understanding of it would help us appreciate the complexities of the situation better mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so so minister I, i do want to go back to 7th october itself when everything was unfolding was it shocking to you you know the level at which you know the brutality of the attack and everything that was happening were you mm-hmm. would you feel very surprised by by how swift and how brutal the whole thing was I would say this the fact that the attack took place didn't surprise me mm. Mm. because the the people in Gaza people in West Bank there is a limit to which uh, they can accept their situation when they feel that they have nothing to hope for and if you look at Gaza 61% unemployed So I think over 70% don't have access to clean drinking water. They're living on aid really and uh, they cannot go beyond a certain uh, uh, distance in the sea to do fishing. Mm. You grow up without hope and you grow up on a diet of hating Israel because you know you see Israel as the oppressor and Israel you feel is controlling every aspect of your life. So how long can that be bottled up? And on the West Bank, the Palestinians also feel the same way because there are increasing number of Israeli settlements. And uh, looking at it as a observer from outside, you feel that this situation is not tenable. At some point it will break out. Mm. How it broke out, you know, precise date, of course I had no idea. and uh, how they overcame the israeli uh, defenses uh, was a surprise to me mm. um israel from all accounts israel seems to have let its guard down or was over reliant on what it felt was its uh, comprehensive technological uh, solutions so the speed and the effectiveness surprised me but the fact that the palestinians rose up to uh, attack didn't surprise me i ex- mm. you know at some point they w- would have risen up either in gaza or in west bank or in both places and uh, to do the maximum damage possible 
Mm. 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 And and I mean, since then, a lot has happened, right? Um, um, I think the world has witnessed a lot of m- more images, more content about all the the um, lives that are being lost. Uh, but one thing we did speak about recently on our podcast was your response to uh, two opinion pieces that came out. Um, the one by Bilahari and the follow-up to to uh, by Firdaus. And uh, like just wanting to understand why you felt the need to speak uh, what you said um, uh, about the views and how certain op-eds, for example, Bilahari, there were about your how your opinions differed from his. You know, I'm in cabinet, I have viewpoints. Mm. And uh, when I feel that it's an important matter and uh, views are being expressed, and if I can add to the debate and if I feel that my viewpoints can add to the debate, I do mm. so. Of course, I've got to be mindful. Once you're in cabinet, it's not often that you can have a personal viewpoint because whatever you say, there is uh, the principle of cabinet acting with one voice. Mm. So I've got to make sure that my views are not inconsistent with the government's position. Mm. I cannot say, well, you know, government has one position, I have this position. That's not tenable. But within that framework, I felt that uh, it was justifiable to express a view. I felt that Bila, Bila Hari, who uh, I consider to be the foremost and the most brilliant uh, policy, foreign policy thinker in Singapore, he was permanent secretary when I was minister for foreign affairs. On many things, I rely on, relied on his advice. He knows far more about the world and foreign policy than I can ever hope to. Mm. And even now, when I have doubts, I go and clarify with him. I seek his advice. I seek his counsel. He is brilliant. Uh, I say that without any qualification. But at the same time, that doesn't mean I cannot disagree with him. Mm. And uh, in this case, I th- had I strongly disagreed with the views he expressed. I felt that he hadn't uh, uh, hadn't put the uh, more balanced perspective of the facts, including the Palestinian perspective. Mm. And uh, I felt that uh, the debate in Singapore will benefit from me expressing my view that uh, some of the things that Israel has done should be put out and uh, we should say this is not right. Mm-hmm. I see, I see. So, I mean, there, mm-hmm. there are, I mean, there is chatter online and even myself, I've spoken to uh, foreigners in Singapore who have this perception that, you know, because of Singapore's, uh, the SAF's ties with, with Israel and everything, that Singapore generally is more pro-Israel. Um, what do you think is, uh, what will you say to people who, who say that, that Singapore has had long historical ties with Israel, 50 years of diplomatic relations, everything? When we were cast out of Malaysia in 1965, mm. we were, in the words of uh, General Winston Chu, who was a chief of our armed forces, we were naked. We had nothing. Mm. Mm. And uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew recounts an episode where immediately after independence, the commander of the Malaysian Armed Forces who was in Singapore went up to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's office, uh, sorry, house, and said, Sir, I will accompany you together with my officers to your office to provide you with security. The subtext being that in your country now, newly independent Singapore, you have no guarantee of security, and mm-hmm. the security has got to be provided by the Malaysian Army. That's how we started. We very quickly built up a credible defense and uh, there was a reason to build up because if Singapore gets attacked, we don't have oil, we don't have resources, you're not going to get the Americans or anybody else coming and defending us. Whether we live or die depends on our own armed forces Mm -hmm. and our ability to defend ourselves. And investors are not going to invest, the country is not going to grow if there is no confidence in its ability to survive. And the SAF is a key element in the ability to survive. So we have to build up. We went and asked Egypt, hmm. Muslim country. Uh, they said no. Hmm. We went and asked India. India is not a Hindu country, though majority Hindu population. Uh, they said no. Hmm. So both Egypt and India turned us down. The Israelis helped us. And it's because of Israel that our SAF is where it is today. And without the Israelis, our SAF could not be, we could not have built it up to this level. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. What is the importance of having built it up to this level? Mm-hmm. Everyone knows, and Prime Minister Mahathir, ex-Prime Minister Mahathir acknowledges, we have a very powerful SAF, and therefore Singapore, you know, if you want to talk to Singapore, you got to negotiate mm. uh, as equals. which is fine with us you know issues have to be discussed we don't want to go and fight about things we shouldn't resort to the military that should not be the first or the second resort it preferably not even the last resort you have it to protect yourself mm. you should really uh, be able to discuss it as countries as equals and we have been able to do that over 50 60 years but that's because singapore is respected and the saf is a key part of that respect and the israelis helped us so we cannot forget that mm. that doesn't mean that uh, when israel acts inconsistent with international law contrary to international law we don't call them out we do from 1967 we have been uh, taking part in un resolutions which have condemned israeli settlements and which have said that what israel is doing is illegal why it is doing something illegal we say so mm. uh, likewise with other countries but that doesn't prevent us from uh acknowledging that israel helped us and uh, having a relationship with israel just as we have a relationship with uh, hundreds of countries around the world different types of relationships um, you know with many countries around the world we have different we you know it all depends on mutual interests mm. of what they can do for you and what you can do for them but when something is wrong we call it out when it's our duty to do so we take part in un resolutions we take part in un debates and we say so that's how i would characterize it mm. and uh, if you look at uh, this particular situation we have uh, raised funds for gaza the saf has delivered the aid to gaza for the palestinians we have uh, taken part in the UN debate and UN resolution that calls for a truce and that says that people ought not to be displaced in Gaza that international law ought to be respected mm. uh, we have said that uh, you know there should not be collective punishment imposed uh, so we have made our views clear at the same time we recognize that Israel has a right of self defense when it's attacked it has a right to self defense but the right of self defense must be uh, exercised within the bounds of international law mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so so then to like a, a lay person you know uh, we we are not in politics we we don't engage in global geopolitical debates so you know when you say they have to adhere to international law is yes. right so what what would then happen if they don't adhere uh like will there like what could be a sequence of events after this whole horror has hopefully subsided that they could be subject to the first question is are they in breach of international law mm. and there is a fierce debate uh, mm. i don't know whether you've been following the spanish prime minister suggested that they may be in breach he doesn't say that they are in breach mm. but he questions whether they are in breach mm. or whether they are complying with international law and israel has strongly protested and said that um, that's just untrue and they are in compliance mm-hmm. israel's position is this there are 30000 hamas fighters these hamas fighters have very cleverly embedded themselves within the civilian population they are in tunnels under civilian structures they are under hospitals so and they are attacking me and they want to destroy me how do i reach them how do i deal with them without uh, the fact that the civilians will also be uh, Uh, casualties in the process mm-hmm. that's israel's response uh, so the real question is uh, is there proportionality in the attacks has it gone beyond the test of proportionality and you can be sure that uh, there will be a lot of arguments over this mm-hmm. but you know this is not the only situation you have yemen mm. yemen where what uh, i think uh, a much larger number i think 400 500000 people have died and uh, in the attack so you have the houthis on one side supported by iran you have the other militia which is supported by united arab emirates and saudi arabia and um, more than a million people if i'm not wrong have been displaced mm. women children very substantial suffering for every one person who has died in gaza i think uh, you have uh, 
seven, eight, maybe uh, ten, twelve people who have died in Yemen, uh, perhaps more, mm-hmm. uh, much more actually, because I think it's four or five hundred thousand compared with fifteen thousand up to now in Gaza, or you have Syria, where again I think half a million people have died, where the government is said to have used uh, chemical weapons and more than 10,000 people have been diagnosed with neurotoxins mm-hmm. uh, damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is must be clearly in breach of international law. Mm-hmm. So you get this everywhere. Uh, not everywhere, but you get this not infrequently. And you know, you get this in a few places. You have the Russian attack on Ukraine mm. and uh, crossing sovereign borders, as we have made clear in parliament and elsewhere, is a breach of international law. Mm. Uh, sending your army across. We take a very serious view of that. And uh, how many people have died? How many? They, uh, none of us have verified it, but allegations are that women have been tortured, they have been dismembered, raped, killed, children have been kidnapped, children have been beheaded and killed. You have missiles flying into civilian cities. Thousands and thousands of people have died. Mm-hmm. So, our we have to look at what's happening around the world. Mm-hmm. You have this happening. You have um, in Myanmar, the government is alleged to have bombed its own people, and again, you know, the casualties are in the tens of thousands. Mm-hmm. Okay. Again, most of the victims are innocent victims. So we need to recognize that there are these. Uh, currently, there is a conflict going on in Yemen. There is a Syrian situation, there is the Myanmar situation, and there is a Gaza situation, and there is a Ukraine-Russian situation. Mm -hmm. You have to look at all of this, and uh, you have to say, okay, how does Singapore approach this? And uh, what is it that we can do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just taking a geopolitical view of things, right? The interesting thing for me is that Singapore's name has come up after, you know, I think the Israeli ambassador to the UK, for example, said that, when Israel pulled out the Gaza Strip, they were hoping that Gaza could become the Singapore of the Middle East. Do you think that is a possibility in our lifetimes that that you know that the situation in Gaza could be one where they live you know in peace, like between Singapore and Malaysia? What Singapore has done is not rocket science. We have said publicly what are the ingredients of success: a good, far-sighted government which is clean and honest. Uh, people who are willing to be hardworking and are prepared to be, you know, focused on education and acquiring of skills and then work hard, and a set of rational policies that encourage hard work, thrift, and um, uh, investments, entrepreneurship, Mm. and a climate that's hospitable to investments, Mm. and safety and security. You provide these, people will thrive. And that's what Singapore has done. I mean, I'm simplifying it, Mm -hmm. but essentially, uh, there is no reason why the same cannot be done in Gaza or anywhere else. The reasons, the obstacles are not that it cannot be done by the people, but the obstacles are the, among the key obstacles are the geopolitical issues I mentioned earlier. The Palestinian leadership, parts of it doesn't want it. Mm. Parts of the Israeli establishment doesn't want it. And they are in a position to block a move towards a peaceful resolution on a two-state solution basis. And Iran doesn't want it. Mm. And they all have significant uh, influence over the outcome. If you can remove these geopolitical or ge- strategic issues, and if you can create an environment in Gaza which would be peaceful and there is security and uh, you know the proper laws and right leadership, there is no reason why Gaza cannot be equal to or better than Singapore. Mm. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, coming back to what is happening in Singapore right now, uh, I mean, there is a lot of chatter online, a lot of sentiments being expressed. And we know that uh, public um, protests are banned. Uh, you know, wearing um, insignia that, that support either or are also banned. But 
where where do you think the level of debate in Singapore is? Like, are you surprised at certain sentiments that have been expressed? Because you know we see all over the world pro Palestinian protests uh, everywhere in the world, but in Singapore protests are disallowed. But at the same time, people are expressing their views online. People will be expressing their views online in Singapore, just like they will be expressing their views online mm. uh, all over the world. Yeah. And whether or not their rallies is not going to, I think, have an impact on how people express their views, it might get a bit more extreme or a bit less extreme. But mm. uh, you will have, I think, a broad range of views expressed for and against both sides in the conflict. And don't forget the huge amount of uh, active interference on the in the online space on all sides mm. to uh, steer the debate in one direction or another. The amount of fake information that has been put on, and this is not necessarily either by uh, Israel or Hamas. Uh, there are also third actors around the world who have a significant interest in distorting what is happening in uh, uh, Israel, Middle mm. East, Gaza, and caricaturing or picturing uh, each of the parties in some way, you know. And of course, the actual parties involved in the conflict have also been accused of uh, supplying or uh, flooding the internet with a lot of emotive uh, misinformation. Mm. Uh, so, the first problem, the first casualty. I think a significant casualty has been truth. Undoubtedly, many things, are, many bad things are happening. Lots of innocent people are dying, so I'm not denying that. Mm. But I'm also saying that uh, the, the internet has been flooded with a lot of fake news as well. Mm. And one challenge is to identify what is true and what is fake. But leave that aside, uh, because there isn't much we can do about it, and it will continue regardless of what we say. And mm. uh, People will get influenced. It's designed to make you, uh, you know, be influenced, both the truth and the fake news. And mm. people will be influenced mm. uh, in favor of or against one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Rallies, physical rallies, is a separate matter. In some places, it has turned ugly. In some places, uh, it's been relatively more peaceful. Our primary concern is, of course, security. Mm. Um, the uh, security situation, but uh, a strong concern also is th that uh, when you allow rallies, you must allow rallies on all sides. Mm. And uh, there will be rallies where it is possible to think of rallies attended predominantly by one ethnic group or another ethnic group, you know, different rallies. And uh, it has a potential to be characterized as uh, uh, being driven, each rally being driven by different races or different religious groups. Mm. And that can be quite detrimental to the minority communities involved. Mm. In this case, the Muslim community or the Malay community. Mm. Uh, within the framework of Singapore, how... Uh, the Muslims may be viewed, could actually turn negative in the context of such rallies. That is one concern. I mean, it, you know, it's a judgment call. Yeah. Mm. And uh, people like me, we worry about uh, Islamophobia, people becoming anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim. And within Singapore, we have something very precious. You know, we treat each other in a friendly way. We have respectful discourse most of the time. And uh, we try and create that social and racial harmony. And one of the key concerns I have is whether that racial, religious, social harmony we have and peace we have, does allowing rallies damage it? Or is it neutral or does it help it? I don't think it helps it. I don't think it will be neutral. I think it has a, there is a significant risk mm. that... It can damage, not immediately, but in the medium term, how people perceive each other mm. across ethnic lines. Mm. It's one of the factors, but of course, a primary consideration also is the security situation. So so just to 
build on uh, what you said about expressing views online. Um, and, and I do appreciate that Singapore, we do have a harmony. And, and, and I really think sometimes we can take that for granted. So people will express views online. But you know when it's individuals or as you say, bad actors posting is one thing. But there have been a few posts that um, um, some people online have highlighted that I've seen myself by, say, the Israeli embassy in Singapore. That when I read, I think one specifically, um, there was a video where the caption was, he will pay and they will pay. Uh, admittedly, that was a few weeks ago. But I remember scrolling through and thinking like, okay, um, is that is that something that is fair to be posted online, especially from an institution like that? So, so then how how would you make sense uh, about that or how would you address that? Or has there been any concerns about posts like that? Well, uh, your question, I think, has got probably two parts. One, what can the government do about it? Mm. Second, whether it's the right thing to do um, by the embassy mm. concerned. Well, what can the government do about it? You must go back to the law. Is there anything in the law that prohibits Embassies are representatives of their countries. They have sovereign immunity. They are pretty much entitled to say what they like and do what they like. Uh, and uh, they, are not Im- they are not subject to the laws of Singapore. Mm. But they have to respect our uh, fundamental rules, one of which is that foreigners don't take part in politics in Singapore, mm. don't intervene in Singapore politics. So uh, we have to apply that test. Is that an interference in our politics? Or is that an expression of Israel's position Mm. uh, on the Gaza conflict? And uh, I think uh, the assessment will be that that's uh, Israeli embassy's explanation and uh, setting out the position of the Israeli uh, view on the Gaza conflict and uh, what's happening. Mm. And so they are within their rights to say these things. And if uh, another embassy were to post a pro-Palestinian comment, likewise, there's nothing we can do about it, nothing we will do about it. But if they, either the Israeli embassy or the anybody else were to say, Singaporeans should do this, 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 mm. or we want uh, Singapore Jews in Singapore to do this, or Christians in Singapore to do this, or you know Muslims in Singapore to do this, uh, we will have considerable concerns. Mm. We will look at it very carefully. And if it amounts to an interference in our domestic politics, mm. then we will take issue with it. Mm. So that is uh, that is at the official level, mm. government, what you can do and what you can't do. And you can take it, that whether it's the American embassy expressing support for the gay movement, LGBT, see, because that's part of this administration's agenda or the European mm. Union expressing its views on a variety of issues, or the Israeli embassy, or any Arab or Muslim or uh, other country expressing its views. Uh, by and large, events outside, on events outside, that's within their uh, right to do so, as long as it doesn't come into interfering with our domestic issues. Mm-hmm. The Whether it is tasteful, whether it's right to do, wrong to do, you know, each of us can have, have a view whether the Israeli embassy should be posting it, whether any other embassy should be posting such stuff. But that's a matter of individual opinion. Mm-hmm. It's not something the government will go and enforce. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think you've been on the ground talking to a lot of people, different people and groups about this issue. What do you think, especially in Singapore, what do you think is the biggest misconception that, you know, people, uh, a layperson might have about this? A lot of people... Um, know what is happening now, right now, mm. you know, 7th of October, post 7th October. Not a lot of people, in fact, very few, have a deeper understanding of what has happened over a much longer period. You can go back to the Balfour Declaration early in the 20th century. You can go back to 1947 when the United Nations declared that Israel will be set up as a state, or 1948 when Israel declared itself to be a state, uh, on one day and the, and the next day it was attacked by five Arab countries and it fought a war on the day pretty much, you know, the day after it became, uh, declared itself an independent state. Uh, you can go to 1967, 1973, um, the 1993 Oslo Accords. Uh, but there is 
no very little understanding or appreciation of the facts and uh, what had happened and why the 1993 Oslo Accords and 1993 and 95 Oslo Accords were not uh, implemented the assassination of Itzhak Rabin in Israel mm-hmm. and the ascendancy of the extremists uh, in uh, e- extreme viewpoints in Israel uh, the rise of Hamas in the amongst the Palestinians uh, Iran's role so these things are i think underappreciated mm. so people naturally feel sympathy for victims and israel is seen as a powerful country with a strong military and the palestinians are seen as weak and defenseless and being attacked and uh, even leaving that aside you know you see innocent children you know war, being bloodied and killed um, people feel s- sympathetic mm. as i said some of it is true Uh, some of it is also fake news uh, and then there are israeli children who were killed on the 7th october attack israeli women who were raped uh, beheaded paraded naked their corpses were paraded naked uh, so you have that too and then now the allegations that some of that is fake news so mm. you know i no longer am able to say which one is true which one is fake um but undoubtedly attack happened on the 7th of october lots of bad things happened after that israel has retaliated and lots of people have died mm. and uh, lots of people who have died and uh, people are reacting you mm. can understand why people are reacting they will have a better understanding of why all of this is happening if they have a certain historical understanding of the facts mm. and then they will also be able to see how complex the situation is and how difficult it is it is going to be to find a solution they will also see the the framework within which singapore can operate you know the limitations not much that countries around the world can do mm. to bring about peace if the parties centrally involved don't want peace mm. Mm. so so how does that influence the way you think about this because you know like basically what terence was saying and what you address was that people sometimes miss the long history of this you've been in politics for quite a while and now you know you as you said before you do speak up on issues like this but how does understanding that there are a lot of younger generations these days who have not lived through that sort of turmoil how does that influence how you communicate about it we try and put out the facts there was a debate in parliament mm. where you know the dpm lawrence minister yeah. of foreign affairs they spoke at length mm. but we have to be realistic uh, foreign policy and you know detailed facts and uh, uh, analysis of uh, all the factors that led to the current situation this is not something that people have the time really i will say everyone leads busy lives including young people mm-hmm. and uh, with that the amount of time they can spend on understanding this is not easy it's up to the government to try and put it across in as simple a term as possible to help people understand. Mm. So mm. and also mm. build up trust with mm. the people that they realize that uh, even if they don't understand everything people in government know and understand and if we take a view and if we express a view that's because we are acting in Singapore's best interests mm. after mm. having considered all the facts. Mm. Mm. So yeah. you you mentioned I mean I think uh, Singapore has always been very clear and our stand has been quite nuanced and, and we try to be balanced about the the issue but you've also said that um that we there's try to be honest about honest, the issues yes yeah and and there's been um there's been a lot of anti singapore rhetoric more anti singapore rhetoric online yes. uh, why do you think that's the case if singapore is you know really trying to be honest and and nuanced about this well your assumption is that if we do something right and we take a clear uh principled position that will appeal to everyone but there are many people around the region and around the world who don't accept other people's principled positions mm. they want people to accept their positions and if you don't agree with me then i shout at you mm. and in fact i will uh, say the worst of you and if i can do some bad things to you i will do so i mean there are people who do who react that way too mm. and uh, this this is essentially uh argument over how to share the land in palestine how to coexist but it has been in many ways uh, 
reworked through the prism of religion and made out into a religious conflict mm. by people with their own agendas and uh, that can easily make people very angry i mean they get influenced and once it's turned into a religious conflict then you either agree with me or you are against me there's no no way of a principled uh, position which is which is not what i want mm. i want you to agree with me mm. and singapore has always been a target if you look at the isd reports even before the gaza conflict singapore was a high profile target any attack on singapore will be in international news all over the world people mm. who do the attacks will become martyrs and um, it now the 7 october attacks and israel's reaction has just uh, given more ammunition for the people who want uh, anti singapore sentiment in the region Mm-hmm. So, but just on that as well, because there's been reports out there about generational differences. A lot more young people around the world seem to be more polarized about this issue than older generations. Do you, why do you think that's the case? If young people are supposed to be more connected, more you know, reading more and seeing the well, more things. Well, you're reading more. You're more connected, and you're seeing more images, and uh, you that will then make you sometimes more angry. Mm. the more you see these things and the algorithms of the social media will also keep feeding you stuff that uh, the way the algorithms work as i understand if something is popular it will be fed to you mm. and usually what is popular is what a lot of people are going to you know you know if that happens to be negative stuff something that has got you know very disturbing pictures and so on that's what gets fed to you and then it's cyclical the more people see it the more popular it will become that's what everybody is seeing mm, mm. so whether uh, people who are social media savvy will get a lot more information mm. along these lines as i said some of which is true some of which may be fake but when you receive it of course you'll become angry mm. Mm. Uh, older people i i personally haven't done surveys to see whether there is a divide okay uh, but uh, older people perhaps Uh, remember that uh, there are many other conflicts around the world that have gone on and there are conflicts going around the world today mm. where even more people have suffered and are continuing to suffer mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so but which are not uh, in the social media as much yeah because if i think if the yemen conflict is in the social media as much i think young people will be angry too Mm-hmm. because i don't think they are reacting specifically to uh, israel and hamas or gaza mm-hmm. they are reacting honestly because they see innocent victims if you see innocent victims in syria subject to the chemical attacks yeah, which took place some years ago or you know current uh, attacks this the civil war or if you see innocent children and women being badly treated and killed in yemen uh, or ukraine i think our young people will react in the same way but it's not as much on their social media mm. as mm. Uh, this gaza conflict mm. so so you know there's one thing about what people should understand about the conflict the long history yeah. um the the fact is that you can say the algorithms and all people are consuming more content like that so with that whole uh, circumstance what worries you most about this conflict and its impact in singapore because as of today you know the truce has ended um the the atrocities have uh, or, or at least the, the 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 violence has resumed so it probably looks like it's going to go on for a while more and people are going to get more and more polarized so what what worries you the most the fact that people have very strong viewpoints mm-hmm. Uh, whether young or not so young i don't think we should take that as a cause for concern mm mm-hmm. it simply means that you know they are reacting as human beings to situation which is very distressing mm and um, it's natural mm to me the cause for concern would be if people are being persuaded by falsehoods and fake news uh, on any conflict including the gaza conflict mm. and we just need to make sure we put out the facts 
so that people are able to, uh, with the background knowledge of the facts, make better sense of what they are getting. Mm. So our task is to aid people make better sense and do our best, knowing that it must be realistic about how much really we can uh, uh, put out. Mm. Yeah. So, so do you? That's with regards to the Israel-Hamas conflict. But do you see that also the you know more anger being shown online about even domestic issues? I, you know, there there will be anger shown. There will be if you take any population, you take a hundred people, mm. uh, you will have a range of viewpoints, and uh, usually the people. who who feel strongest about things would be the people who would uh, express their viewpoints uh, in very often express their viewpoints online and some of them may take a angry tone mm. i think we have to accept that as normal and uh, the key thing for the government is to make sure the, that that it does honestly and fairly by the entire population of Singapore, but knowing that you cannot satisfy everybody, fairly and make sure people have jobs, make sure people have a roof over their head, make sure people can get access to good health care, make sure people can get access to good education, and uh, say, you know, uh, I'm you have jobs and I keep making sure that your jobs get better or your salaries uh you know uh being paid by making sure that the economy is growing mm. and if there are factors beyond my control and the economy is not growing then you know I explain to you why i can't do anything about that is a macroeconomic factors why prices are rising because of inflation worldwide there is a ukraine war in ukraine and ukraine exports 10% of the world's wheat and between russia and ukraine they export a lot of foodstuffs, oil prices have been erratic, supply chains have been disrupted, so there is an impact on prices, then I have to make sure that I put in money into people's pockets, mm. uh, means tested or you know at a certain income level to make sure we cushion them, uh, cushion uh, them from the impact, the full impact of these uh, variances. Mm. And you must accept <coughs> that nevertheless, uh, a number of people will be unhappy. Government's task is to keep working away and make sure the unhappiness is reduced. Mm. Uh, you are there to do a job. You know, people are unhappy means they are expressing feedback. Mm. You must look at it like that. You can't say why they are unhappy. Mm. <laughs> but, but do you feel that, because um, you've been in politics for a long while, even pre-social media, yes. do you how do you balance now, you know, uh, doing what the do doing what you need to do, for example, what you said, putting roof over your head, making sure people have jobs, but and sometimes having to address the public sentiment about issues that might uh, not even be related to policy. Because, I wouldn't say uh, addressing public sentiment sometimes. I think you've got to understand public sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a key part of the job. You've got to do the right thing, but you also got to know what public sentiment is. But you must have a careful assessment of public sentiment. It doesn't mean that uh, those who shout loudest express the public sentiment. Mm -hmm. You got to always make an assessment as to whether that represents uh, what proportion of the population does that sentiment uh, uh, reflect. Mm -hmm. Is it a very small minority? Or is it a more significant minority? Or is it the majority? So you got to make those assessments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you got to say even if it's only a small minority, then you got to see is there something I can do about it? Uh, is it a fair request or is it unreasonable? It's only unreasonable if by giving in there you are going to affect the majority. Then it's unreasonable. Then you can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, you got to try and satisfy as much as possible. Do what you can. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, the context of me asking that is because. Uh, I mean, there's been so many things that have been happening on the global level. But even this year, there have been a lot of things that have been happening within politics um, uh, that was was surprising this year. You know, with all the, the respective uh, scandals that came out. 
Um, so that's why I was I was curious about the approach because you can focus on doing like um, policy work, but there have been very public debates about some of the things. Part like, and parcel of politics, mm, you know. Mm. People are entitled to ask you about uh, how the process as well as the final outcome. Mm. Outcome is all these substantive results, but uh, people also expect uh, there to be a certain process. and there will be focus on the process and you've got to make sure that the process stands up to scrutiny mm. it's mm. par for the course i mean mm. i mean for us also it was uh, we attended parliament uh, yeah. for the first time in our lives this year and yes. observed the process and all yes. um do you think that it's a good thing that more singaporeans are very interested in the whole process like literally like us going down and watching yeah. it Or you know, there's some people say also if politics is boring, that's actually a good thing. If like nobody is <laughs> discussing things, that just that means stuff is working. What 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 do you think about that? Well, uh, first of all, if you go back to the '60s and '70s, we had very interesting politics. A lot mm. of people were interested uh, in politics. So being interested in politics is not a new thing in Singapore. Uh, I would say if it's boring, what it means is no issues have come up. Mm. which means that things are working if it is specifically interesting in some ways that means some issues have either come up or have been created or manufactured mm. and uh, it's for you to deal with it and explain if you are wrong then just admit that you are wrong and move on and uh, you know take the right steps in moving on uh, appropriate steps uh, and tell the people if it has been manufactured then you explain it and uh, you carry on with doing the right thing it's part and parcel of politics you just have to accept it i wouldn't myself think that people are more interested or less interested today i think my primary take is people are primarily interested in their jobs their family their home they want a government that makes sure all of these things happen and they want their politicians to behave in a certain way Mm. they expect certain standards you know all of that particularly if it's government politicians yeah uh, there are different expectations depending on you know which side you are i think mm. the uh, beyond that the they are interested also that the process in singapore you know parliamentary process they want to see that uh, sensible issues are or issues are sensibly debated and discussed and uh, i think many singaporeans expect a mature discussion online you will get some people whether deliberately or otherwise trying to mislead what happens mm. in these debates and in these processes because and shout very loud you just have to deal with it mm. but do you yeah. think the the standards that are being set for politicians um can be unreasonable because i mean w- some of the the things that were debated in parliament this year involve yourself you know with your own yes. personal lives um i know for content creators sometimes the internet expects you one way but for politicians do you find it unreasonable because that whole debate about right out and all that occupied so much of mainstream consciousness <laughs> well I think uh, it's difficult to say it's reasonable or unreasonable if people are interested you just have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And as I said in parliament it involves a public asset, you know, a house that's government uh, property and a minister is renting out uh, renting from the government mm-hmm. a property. So it's legitimate to question, hey, I want to know, you know, did you fiddle? Uh, did you do this honestly? Uh, were the rules observed i think it's entirely fair and legitimate to ask those questions i think what's not legitimate is uh, make imputations and make allegations like some of the opposition uh, uh, has done and completely f- false statements relating to you know my son mm. having done contracts there i mean you know there is a p- opposition politician who makes this allegation shamelessly mm. and without any basis mm. so that sort of thing is uh, unfortunate but there are people with different standards of morality mm. and there are people who will make these allegations 
without a shred of evidence and without any basis and then you know we'll have to come out and say this is untrue uh, but subject to that i think uh, asking questions about uh, minister on uh, his uh, where he stays if it is government property i think is legitimate mm. you know uh, you did you pay a proper price which you know which is why we had a cpib investigation which was very thorough mm. and uh, this is a property that wasn't rented out for four and a half years it was on the market it wasn't rented out and then uh, i go and i make a bid through my agent it's market price and uh, i get it uh, i spend a lot of money on it and all of that was put out mm, yeah. uh, not a lot of people i think have the patience to go through this in detail but uh, when questions are asked you have to deal with this mm, yeah and and is that something that has been like how has your perspective with regards to issues like this changed over time because from the time you entered politics it was a totally different uh, space you know like uh, social media now, people having a voice how you dealt with this may be different but the fundamentals are the same i think uh, the government has got to act with uh, absolute financial uh, probity and uh, if questions are asked you've got to be prepared to open up and say everything mm. that's all that's the way mr lee kuan yew has always dealt with things and that's why singapore is successful Mm. and if we ever move away from that we'll be done for so if questions are asked whether it's me or whether it's any other minister or prime minister we have to put the cards on the table mm. Mm. and have open ourselves up for a full investigation mm. which is what i did mm. yeah. and do you think like um, it was i mean there there were instances when family members were brought into a discussion and all that is that something you feel that shouldn't be in part politics it should uh, be off limits i think it shouldn't be i mean you want to take on the minister or the politician or the mp you do so mm. you bring in the family member if you have a basis for saying the family member benefited of course if my son had benefited from it mm. then it's okay but for some fellow to say he did the contracts mm-hmm. when that's absolutely untrue i think that shows a certain base character mm. yeah mm-hmm. and and um i know about speaking about say um, falsehoods online um i know when the pofma was introduced i think singapore was one of the first in the world to we to were the first one we designed the legislation mm. yes so in your view how has pofma performed since it's i think it's um, been useful if you look at the falsehoods that were being put out uh now after the we made the correction order people uh, are much more careful putting out the same falsehoods i give you one example sdp put out a falsehood relating to you know 10 million population the precise allegation you can go and look it up it was untrue and a pofma order was made they challenged it in court they lost and uh, after that i don't see it being repeated this is important because you want to debate in public you want to debate about population policies you must debate it on facts you can't bring in false suits and then mislead people and then debate based on the misleading false suits or based on false suits mm. so uh, and many other types of false suits you know, on covid on a variety of other f- factors and when there are false even on redoubt there are so many false suits which uh, opposition politicians uh, amongst others have indulged in and so pofma orders have been issued but but is it a concern that sometimes issuing a pofma order to something brings a lot more attention to it immediately it may bring a lot more attention but uh, this is not uh, you know you're not trying to change people's minds immediately research suggests that you know when people believe in a falsehood they're not going to change their mind because you show them or prove to them that it's false mm. but over time the fact that it has been ordered uh, you know it's been shown to be false will have an impact uh, particularly if uh, 
the falsehood is not repeated. If the falsehood is repeated, then there are other measures in POFMA to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so, um, what what would you say to the rhetoric that you know people are saying that the government right now there's a sense of almost disconnect. Uh, from the the population when it comes to I think particularly even the readout case and and other things that um, have come out uh, it is a is is a qualitative feeling uh, that seems to be out there and I know it's arguable because it's it's subjective but do you get a sense or do you get people saying that and or, or and how would you respond to that a disconnect between the government and the people yeah I think. Uh, one of the reasons why the pap has been able to sort of adjust its policies without too much ideology but on a very practical level on a variety of things which matter for people is because first it understood that improving the livelihoods of people is critical and proper governance is essential for the country to move ahead and for the people to succeed and second that in doing so we have to be honest and we must perform and we must be above board and third that you have to constantly keep in touch mm. you have to have the f- pulse of the people constantly and how do you do that not by just sitting in your office and making policies whether a minister or mp we meet the people sessions we have walkabouts we have you look at my social media and you look at how often i am on the ground mm. and how often i am pressing the flesh and talking to people and people are telling me what the issues are uh, what they are feeling what prices whether it's they are happy they are not happy every issue on the ground uh, we get uh, direct unvarnished feedback from our residents and every minister goes down every mp goes down and uh, if they don't after a while in the next elections they are no longer there mm. because the party will bring in somebody else uh, so you have to you have to keep in close touch with your residents you have to understand their concerns you even if you don't live their lives you have to be really part of that social fabric and understand what's going on Mm. Uh, that is the pap dna mm. and uh, you understand that you then you know what to do it has uh, not been an um, issue in the past as to where you lived as long as you pay for it honestly using your own money mm. and uh, in my case in redout i think it became an issue because uh, it took some time between the allegations coming out and the debate in parliament and in the interim weeks there were lots of lurid allegations mm. about my benefiting financially uh, taking advantage of the state allegations of conflict of interest even lawyers jumping in uh, totally untrue articles even mm. by lawyers mm. uh, and highly inaccurate you know they even mislead on uh, what the provisions are on conflict of interest and then they try and come out with some theory when there is no conflict of interest no conflict of interest because there can only be a conflict of interest if i have an interest in the matter and i make a decision if i am not making a decision i wasn't making a decision i was not in the chain of command i recused myself somebody else took over so it's absolute bald dash and any lawyer worth his salt will know that and you have a senior counsel nevertheless writing about it uh absolute nonsense mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so you uh, you have this a lot of people jumping in and uh that i think uh, colors perceptions mm. it's perceptions oh you know is uh, is taken uh, government money is taken government land is taken advantage of course people will get angry Mm. yeah and uh, so parliamentary debate took place some time later cpib investigations i think people are prepared to, on the whole to accept it but uh, nevertheless then it becomes a question of optics mm. yeah mm-hmm. so i mean uh, would you characterize this year 
has been one of the most uh, busiest or most intense years in your career as a politician mm -hmm. with everything that's that's happening around the world in Singapore as well. I wouldn't say that. I think, uh, you know, if it's uh, not an easy business <laughs> running mm. Singapore. Mm. It's very intense year after year. Uh, because things don't break out into headlines doesn't mean in a, it's any less intense. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's an intense business and none more so intense than for the PM because he best all the responsibility mm. and then it goes down the line sure mm. <laughs> so so just going back to the israel hamas uh, conflict like i mean what what happens from here like how how what do you think is the we best case scenario we don't determine what happens from here i think uh, you know as you say the truce has ended today mm. we can just hope that hopefully there will be a longer truce mm. and hopefully wiser counsel prevails in the region mm. And an understanding that two-state solution is the only way. The legitimate aspirations of Israelis and the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinians should be met. And it can only be met through a two-state solution with guarantees for the security of both states. Mm, mm. And both uh, with a leadership that says we can live in peace with each other. Mm. Yeah. So, so, you know, on that note of like global politics, local politics, one thing is as people who consume content or people who are interested um, we, we hear a lot of people talking about issues, um, policy, uh, sentiment. But for you as a politician, you know, over the years, how important, how do you weigh what you say versus how you say it? I, you have, I've always believed that you've got to be clear mm. and you've got to say what you think on a, situation but uh, sometimes you also have to judge uh, when you say this would it be understood mm. i mean if it's, if it's not going to be understood then you've got to go and think of how best can you say it so that people understand what you're saying mm. because in public communication the risk of being misunderstood is very high mm. so you've got to be honest and direct but uh, you've got to do it in a way that people can understand what you really mean. Mm. And uh, so how you say it is important to make sure that you are understood, right? Mm. And that's my own view. There are others who will take a different view. Mm. Mm. Yes. But it, like even the approach to say things, right? Ha like your own perspective, how has it changed over the years? Because you've been in... I don't think it has changed. Mm. No. It's uh, maybe become more refined as you get more experienced, you know that certain things work and certain things don't work, certain things are apt to be misunderstood. So that's how I think change, if any. But my fundamental premise that you say it as it is hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we talked a little bit about um, what young people are reading and consuming and, and you know maybe misconceptions they might be having. Like what can the average person do to a better understand everything that's no. going on and not get influenced by all the it's very know, rhetoric difficult. online. It's very difficult because even experts can't distinguish between what is true and what is not true. Mm. Mm. It comes there, it looks very real. They even can spoof uh, legitimate media. They can spoof uh, actual high, well-known, high-profile figures. Mm. Um, You've, there will be a lot of misinformation, there will be a lot of fake news, there will be a lot of deliberate uh, attempts to mislead. It will all be flooding, it is flooding the internet and it will flood your, uh, you know, uh, handsets and everything else. Governments around the world are grappling with it, we just have to try and deal with it and put out the facts as much as we can. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I I don't have a simple solution for you. No books that they can read no or books, anything. Uh, no no podcast. No, no podcast. <laughs> no. So I mean, uh, across the board, like um, right now, what what worries you about the future? Um, both what, from the perspective of Singaporeans oh, yourself. Yeah, what yeah. has always worried others, anybody serious who thinks about Singapore, we are seven hundred and twenty eight square kilometers. Mm. You know, that's all that Singapore is. How long does it take for you to drive on the PIE from Changi to Jurong? Mm -hmm. And how long does it take for you to drive from Woodlands to Robinson Road, north to south? Not very long. Mm -hmm. Less than an hour each on a clear day without jam, within the legal limit. 
So that's your country. No resources. Mm. If anything happens, the world goes into a recession, what do you fall back on? Only the reserves that we have built up, nothing else. Um, we have so far succeeded by running very hard, being united, having a competent leadership at the top, which is united and focused and long term. And uh, we, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, some debate, but not a lot of debate about the direction. You know, you get competent people, they think through the policies, they explain it, and then move on, implement it. A lot more focus on implementation. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time arguing over what is the right policy, and that has worked for Singapore. Whether that will remain so, and whether that will work in the future is a big question. My worry is that... Uh, as uh, whether that model will continue to remain so mm -hmm. or whether it will change and uh, also whether you know we will continue to be a hungry competitive uh, society mm -hmm. because there are lots of people out there who want to take away our lunch and they are bigger countries they have more resources they have more people they have Simply a per capita, they have more bright people in the sense that, not sorry, per capita in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. Because we have 3.2 million citizens, now 3.5, 3.6. They will have 35, some have 100. So uh, proportionately, they will have more uh, people who can compete uh, at the same level with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, their costs are lower. They have uh, the ability to attract investments. They are hungry. So how do we make sure, I'm not saying our people are not hungry or losing mm -hmm. their hunger, but how do we make sure that that remains so? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure we don't go down the way some developed countries, many developed countries have gone where the hunger is no longer there, mm -hmm. where the sense that we have arrived is a predominant sense where there is a greater focus on how you divide the pie rather than how you make the pie grow bigger. Mm. And these are all some very serious concerns. Mm. And, and what is the, the hardest thing that is keeping you from like, um, or at least making it harder to pursue that goal? <laughs> it's not specific to Singapore. It's you always, at any stage, if you are in political leadership, you've got to persuade the people. Mm. of A, the challenges, B, the way in which you deal with the challenges, and you have to make them accept and understand that the results are worth having. Mm. And you've got to have the competence to achieve it. What would you say to you know a young person who, you know, maybe he's trying, he's trying to get ahead and, and trying to strive in life, but maybe feeling a bit down because <coughs> of competition and different things that he's going through. What was your message to inspire? Competition, him? if there is no competition in Singapore, the competition comes from outside. In today's uh, connected world, uh, an investor can get things done in different countries. Mm. And mm. the competition is not within Singapore. It's mm. all outside of Singapore. And competition is a fact. There are hundreds of millions of Chinese, there are hundreds of millions of Indians, there are hundred million Vietnamese. There are 270 million Indonesians. Uh, Jakarta is a thriving hub for internet startups. Mm. Uh, Vietnam is catching up fast. China and India, of course, are well known. And not to forget the West, you know, there are pockets in the West and uh, larger pockets in the US which are f extremely competitive, mm. well ahead of us in many ways. So this is a fact, all of these exist. We just have to deal with it. Mm. And uh, we have to keep telling our people that uh, you know, we don't have much to fall back on. Mm. We have to compete there. We have to continue to earn our lunch and dinner. Sure. Mm. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, yeah. so we have spoken about the past, the present, the future. Uh, and now to wrap up, one thing we do ask all our guests, whether you're a politician, national athlete, filmmaker, is to give us a one show thing, mm. uh, which mm. is basically something that you would recommend our audience um, either read or watch or listen to. 
So Terence and I can go first in case you need to think of something. <laughs> um, yeah. Terence, sure. you got your one. Uh, I've been reading this book called "It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work." Mm. Uh, it's by the founders of this very successful uh, software company, Basecamp, mm. uh, where they've created a whole system where they they know how to create a work environment that is conducive to someone building a career, but also you know living aspects of life, building a family, building the work-life balance that they aim for. So it's very interesting because they've been very successful tech entrepreneurs and now they've come out with, uh, I mean, they've written this book about five years ago that takes all those lessons and puts them in a very succinct, easy read. Uh. So I got that I got that recently and I thought, oh, it's a very, very interesting way of looking at how, you know, you still work hard, but you also make sure that uh, you can find balance in the different aspects of your life. Mm, cool. My, my one true thing is uh, less academic. Uh, it's okay. uh, I've recently started watching Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, because my wife is really into Harry Potter. I haven't read the books. Uh, I'm trying to watch it. I can see the appeal. So it's not a full one shot thing yet. It's a mm. part one shot thing yet because yeah. it's a... Uh, I can see the appeal, but I haven't really got bit into it yet. La. Okay. But I can foresee it being a one shot thing. La. So it's a start of a potential it's a start of a relationship. Yeah. La. Start of a relationship. Yes. Nice. And, and what about you? Minster? I can talk to you about books. You know, I've been into books now which discuss why some regions of the world do better than others mm. uh, based on history or culture or geography. But actually, probably what I will mention is something unusual. I don't usually watch films, mm. but uh, sometimes when I'm on a flight, I watch. And uh, on a recent flight, I watched the uh, a recent French version of The Three Musketeers. Mm. It, part one, there's part two. Thankfully, you don't have to wait too long for part two. I think it's going to be out soon. Part one, very interesting. Uh, the Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. And I would, and depending on interest, but I would recommend that. It's mm. a lot of fun, mm. uh, but it's not cheesy, I think. And uh, it's got a, it's, it takes some artistic license with uh, the original uh, version by Alexander Dumas. Mm. Yes, it has to for a modern audience. But uh, lots of action, lots of uh, background. I mean, for those who know French history, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Awesome. Worth watching. Wow. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. We'll yeah. put the link in the show notes. Yes. And yeah. and yeah, that's, yeah. that's the, the three Musketeers. That's, yeah, that's Musketeers. a French name. I wouldn't attempt to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. But yeah, thank you, Minister, for the time and, thank and you. you know sharing about this very important topic. Uh, it's thank something that we much. want to do for very long. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. And hopefully we'll have you again on the podcast in future. Well, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks, thank everyone, you. for thank listening. Bye. Bye-bye.